next is Sursa Victory. Hello. Hi, how you doing? I am doing well. It's the end of a, of a great day. Yeah, it's been a long one. <laughs> uh, yeah, you want to just take it away? Sure. Let me pull up my notes here. Uh, so uh, thanks to everybody who stuck around for this last talk of the day. Uh, my name is Sursa Victory, and in this presentation, I'm going to talk about choice design and roguelikes. Over the next half hour, I'm going to cover a few different topics. Uh, first, I'll introduce myself, my background, and why I decided to talk about choice design. After that, I'll step into the academic and popular literature to briefly describe why choosing is fun and dramatic for players. I'll then talk about the types of choices in games that players find engaging. And finally, I'll present everybody with a few ideas for choices that you might experiment with in your own traditional roguelike. So before I begin, I want to take a second to define a term that I'll be using often in this talk, traditional roguelike. Uh, my reason for using this term is not to get into debates about what counts as a roguelike or a roguelite and so on. Uh, instead, I'm using the term as a loose catch-all for games that closely resemble the original rogue and its close contemporaries, so turn-based dungeon crawlers with ASCII graphics or minimalist tile sets. And while the examples and advice in this talk focus primarily on these sorts of games, my hope is that the concepts I'll be going over can be helpful, regardless of what kind of game you're making. So that all being said, I'd like to start by very quickly introducing myself. I've been a professional programmer since 2006 and a freelance game designer and writer since 2008. I'm probably most well known for my Death Trap dungeon modules and monsters for tabletop role playing games, the most recent of which have been published by Kobold Press. A few years back, I developed a remake and expansion of the original Rogue shown on the left. Uh, I'll draw on my remake a little bit during this presentation. I'm also working on a new roguelike, the box art of which is shown on the right. My primary business these days, however, is writing choose your own adventure style game books aimed at tween and teen girls. Because of this, I've had to do a lot of thinking, a lot of researching, and a lot of practicing when it comes to choice design. As a fan of roguelikes and a hobbyist roguelike developer, I wanted to share what I've learned with you all and start a discussion on how to more intentionally apply principles of choice design to roguelikes. Before getting into the specific kinds of engaging choices that appear in games, I'd first like to discuss why choices help create an enjoyable experience for players. Choices in games are fun and dramatic for four reasons. Uh, first, they test the player's ability to weigh the benefits and opportunity costs of trade-offs. Second, they give the player a sense of agency in your game world. Third, they create moments of uncertainty that are important for player engagement. And finally, they provide moments that help make the player feel smart. Not all choices in games are equally compelling. In the literature about games, designers highlight trade-offs as an essential element of good choice design. In game designer Ian Schreiber's course, Game Design Concepts, he writes that generally, Interesting decisions in games involve some kind of trade-off. That is, you are giving up one thing in exchange for another. Jeff Warrender uses stronger language to describe trade-offs in You Said This Would Be Fun, What Makes a Game Good, and How to Make a Good Game. He writes that a well-designed choice in a game should be agonizing. In an agonizing decision, you have several things you want to do, but you can't do them all. By choosing A, I'm giving up something about B that I'd very much like to have, and vice versa. In an agonizing decision, for each available option, there are both upsides and downsides, considerations and counter-considerations. It is the tension the player feels when having to weigh these considerations and counter-considerations that lead to fun and drama. In Players Making Decisions, Game Design Fundamentals and the Art of Understanding Your Players, Zach Highwiller doesn't mince words. He writes that trade-offs are the single most useful technique. 
for making a decision interesting, hands down. And as you'll see in a moment, each of the types of engaging choices described in this talk are some flavor of trade-off. Agency is crucial for player engagement. If the player feels like nothing she does has any effect on the game's outcome, she is likely to become bored and frustrated. This desire for agency in games, according to Zach Highwiller, stems from people's need for agency in life more generally. In Players Making Decisions, he draws on this theory of self-determination put forward by psychologists Edward Decke and Richard Ryan, writing that people need to feel control in some measure of who they are and what they do. They need to feel as though their actions control their life's outcomes. Games are clearly in the practice of tasking players with activities that challenge their mastery and autonomy. It's part of why games are so widespread in most cultures. Uh, games in many ways are a low stakes opportunity for us to satisfy this human urge for agency in a world where we often have none. Gameplay that gives players a sense of agency can be described as meaningful. And in their widely cited text, Rules of Play, Game Design Fundamentals, Katie Solon and Eric Zimmerman explain that well-designed and clearly communicated choices are the way in which gameplay is made meaningful. They write that meaningful play occurs when the relationships between the player's actions and outcomes in a game are both discernible and integrated into the larger context of the game. Creating meaningful play is the goal of successful game design. And by discernible and integrated, Solon and Zimmerman mean a couple things. First, did the player know what choice she was making? Was she provided with clear feedback on the immediate result of her choice? And is it clear to her how her choices affected the longer term outcome of the game? If as players we knew, for certain how a game would end before it began, we likely wouldn't enjoy the game very much. If in Rogue, for example, the player always knew that she would get the amulet and escape to the surface, or that every unidentified scroll was safe, she might become bored pretty quickly. So much of the fun of games then lives in those moments where it's not clear which way a situation might go, and that the player's decisions have an impact on what happens next, for better or worse. In Uncertainty in Games, Greg Kostikian writes that games require uncertainty to hold our interest, and that the struggle to master uncertainty is central to their appeal. And in traditional roguelikes where so many things are randomized, this struggle to master uncertainty takes center stage. Uh, we have no uncertainty as to what waits on the next dungeon level, what effect the unknown potion will have when quaffed, or whether the next attack against the Medusa will hit. All we can do as rogues is attempt to master the uncertainty by playing carefully and making smart choices that put us in a better position to capitalize on the helpful surprises and mitigate the unhelpful ones. Jeff Warrender talks about the uncertainty inherent in making a choice. A good decision gives us the feeling of being pulled in two or more different directions. Tension in a narrative creates interest because the audience wants to see how the storyteller will resolve it. And a similar principle applies to games. The presence of tension creates interest as you select your course and then see what the outcome will be. Going back to Jeff Warrender again, he lays out in You Said This Would Be Fun a number of motivations that people have for playing games. And one such motivation, according to Warrender, is to feel smart. He writes that games can provide the experience of making choices and seeing the result in bite-sized chunks, giving you little victories that make you feel intelligent. Game designer Rafe Koster goes even further in A Theory of Fun for Game Design, the thesis of which is that all engagement in games ultimately stems from the desire to learn and to feel smart. Fun, he writes, is all about our brain feeling good, the release of endorphins into our system. One of the subtlest releases of chemicals is at that moment of triumph when we learn something 
or master a task. This almost always causes us to break out in a smile. There are many ways we find fun in games, but this is the most important. Catherine Ispister expresses a similar sentiment in How Games Move Us, Emotion by Design. To the human brain, playing a game is more like actually running a race than watching a film or reading a short story about a race. When I run, I make a series of choices about actions I will take that might affect whether I win. I feel a sense of mastery or failure, depending on whether I successfully execute the actions in the ways that I intended. My emotions ebb and flow as I make these choices and see what happens as a result. And this ebbing and flowing of choices, uh, of emotions as a result of choices, is, in my opinion, one of the most entertaining parts of traditional roguelikes. My favorite runs, personally, are often characterized by wild swings between this is the best run ever, I'm unstoppable, to there is no way I'm getting out of this mess. Now that I've given you an overview of how choosing leads to fun and drama for players, I want to get into the meat of this talk, the types of engaging choices in games. In this section, I'll describe five different types of engaging choices, mutually exclusive actions, risk versus reward, now versus later, resource trade, and dilemma. I'll illustrate each choice type by drawing on examples from popular traditional roguelikes. The first choice type I'd like to describe is mutually exclusive action. And in a mutually exclusive action choice, the player has multiple things she would like to do, but she can't do them all. This is, in essence, the basic trade-off. The player must weigh the benefits of one course of action over the opportunity costs of not picking the other courses of action. A great illustration of this type of choice is your turn in any traditional roguelike. Typically, the player only gets one action on her turn before the monsters and the environment take their turns. There might be several things she'd like to do on one turn, drink a potion of stone skin and cast a scroll of enchant weapon and swap her magical rings and zap the charging troll with her wand of fireballs. However, she'll only be able to choose one of these actions. And in crunch moments where every turn counts, and one wrong move can mean permadeath, this choice can be quite tense. Another great example of a mutually exclusive choice are the treasure rooms in my favorite roguelike, Brogue. These rooms contain several treasures, each with their own unique benefits. Once the player takes an item off its pedestal, cages drop down over the other items. Thus, she can only choose one item to leave with. Like all trade-offs, there is not necessarily a right or a wrong answer here. The player must assess which option to choose based on her play style, her build, what's happened so far in the game, and what she predicts might come later. The final example I'll give of a mutually exclusive choice are the skill shrines in Forays into Norindrin. By interacting with a shrine, the player can boost the skill tied to that shrine, such as magic or stealth. These shrines typically come in pairs, and if she accepts the benefit of one shrine, the other goes inert. Thus, the player must think carefully about which skill she'd prefer to level up. When people think about choices in games, they often think about this one, risk versus reward. And in a risk versus reward choice, the player has an option between a lower risk lower reward option, and a higher risk, higher reward option. Such choices challenge the player to assess the value of a potential reward relative to her ability to mitigate the risks of seeking that reward. Maybe one of the most iconic risk versus reward choices in traditional roguelikes is the use of unidentified items. The player must weigh the peril of using an unknown item that might be dangerous or cursed against the direness of her situation. If the player is surrounded by monsters, is using an unknown scroll and hoping it's teleport worth the risk of it being explosive runes instead? Another common element of traditional roguelikes that present a risk reward choice are out of depth monsters. 
As the name implies, these enemies appear on dungeon levels much earlier than they would normally, thus posing a serious threat to the player. However, defeating such monsters could earn the player significant experience points and loot. The player must weigh whether she feels confident or equipped enough to engage with an out-of-depth monster, or if it's better to just steer clear. A third common risk-reward element in traditional roguelikes are vaults, chambers teeming with both dangerous monsters and powerful treasures. When encountering a vault, the player must choose whether the treasures present justify the risk of engaging with a horde of tough enemies. The next type of choice I'd like to describe is the now versus later choice. And in these situations, the player has a limited resource. And if she uses it now, she can't use it later. Alternatively, the player can have something modest now or hold out for something better later. Now versus later choices challenge the player to balance short-term immediate needs versus her long-term goals. Consumable items or items with a limited number of uses are a common example of a now versus later choice in traditional roguelikes. Items such as potions or scrolls can only be used once and then they're gone. Likewise, wands can only be zapped so many times before they fizzle. In any given situation, the player must assess whether it warrants using that item up or if it's smarter to hold on to it for a potentially more serious situation later. Forays into Norindrin includes what might be my favorite example of a now versus later choice in traditional roguelikes. So unlike many other roguelikes, which allow the player to rest and recover whenever she can find a safe corner, Forays gives the player one rest action she can take per dungeon level. Once she rests and recovers, she can't rest again until she reaches the next dungeon level. And this creates an interesting tension as the player must decide how serious her situation truly is before using up her one opportunity to rest per dungeon level. A third example of a now versus later choice comes from my own remake of Rogue. And in it, the player can become a priestess to one of the three goddesses by praying at a high altar. Early in the game, the player will encounter a lesser altar where she could become a lesser priestess. However, if she does, does so, she won't be able to pray at a different altar later to become a high priestess. So similar to the rest mechanic in Forays into Norindrin, the player must assess how badly she needs the boon of priestesshood, priestesshood early in her run, or if she feels confident enough that she can survive to the deeper levels to earn the boons of being a high priestess. The fourth choice type I'd like to talk about is resource trade. And in a resource trade, the player can, of course, trade something she has for something she doesn't. The thing being traded for typically is useful in a different way or in a different context than the thing that she's trading away. An example resource trade in traditional roguelikes are the blacksmith forges in Adom. These forges can be used to repair or enhance weapons and armor, but doing so requires the player to spend metal ingots. The player can earn ingots by melting down other metallic items in her inventory, thus trading them for attack or defense buffs. Another example of a resource trade choice is the magic lamp in NetHack. Now, unlike other lamps, the magic lamp doesn't run out of oil, thus making it extremely useful in navigating the dark and perilous levels of Gehenna. The player can choose to rub the lamp to summon a genie and make a wish. However, doing so turns the magic lamp into an ordinary oil lamp that will burn out. Thus, the player must decide if and when she wants to trade one resource, an inexhaustible light source, for a different resource, a wish. A third and final example of a resource trade choice comes from my remake of Rogue. The player can encounter these inert golems with a ring-shaped slot in their chest. If the player chooses to give up one of her magical rings to put it into the slot, the ring is lost and the golem comes to life as a companion that fights alongside the player. In these situations, the player must weigh the value of her magical ring's powers 
against the value of having a tough bodyguard monster. The fifth and final choice that I'd like to talk about is dilemma. And in a dilemma, the player has failed in some way and is forced to choose between two or more things to give up or punishments to suffer. And failing in this context could mean stumbling into a trap, falling victim to a powerful monster ability, using a cursed item, solving a puzzle incorrectly, and so on. And to be honest, it was pretty difficult for me to find examples of dilemmas in traditional roguelikes. So if anybody has examples that come to mind, I'd love to hear about them in the breakout room or the chat. Now, that being said, I did put together a mock-up of what a dilemma might be like in a traditional roguelike. So in this mock-up, and I hope you can see that okay, uh, the rogue encounters a rare monster, a Balrog, and fails her saving throw against its explosive, fiery aura. And rather than destroy all of the rogue scrolls or incinerate one at random, she instead is prompted to choose which scroll gets burned up. So by turning this type of interaction into a dilemma choice, a roguelike developer can inject a fun moment of drama, an agonizing decision to quote Warrender, into the player's experience. So as you're thinking about how to implement choices in your own roguelike, uh, I invite you to pay special attention to how your generation algorithm layers multiple choices. By presenting the player with multiple choices of varying types at once, you can create some truly engaging scenarios. So here's an example from a recent game I played of my Rogue remake. So after falling through a pit trap very early in the game, I ended up in this chamber. And I really had to sit and think about my move here for a minute as there was a lot of choices to weigh. Should I run away from these powerful out of depth monsters or fight them to get their experience points and their loot? Should I use a consumable escape item like a scroll of teleport? Should I take a chance on an unidentified item, such as zapping the Medusa with an unknown wand? Should I risk the Medusa's gaze to stop and drink from that fountain up there in the top right corner, which itself has random effects? Or is this a, situ a situation where I use up my once per game prayer to my goddess for help? Uh, it's my opinion that these high stakes moments with layered choices are a great embodiment of the fun zone of roguelikes. And it should be something that we strive for as roguelike developers. In these last few minutes of my talk, I'm going to suggest some ideas, high level ideas, for choices you might experiment with in your own traditional roguelike. So what you might do is offer the player a choice of upgrades or threats to unlock at predetermined intervals. You might present the player with branching stairs leading to either a lower danger level with less treasure or a higher danger level with more treasure. You might put multiple locked dungeon chambers on a level, but the rogue only has one key. And I put those in quotes because it doesn't have to be a literal lock and key. Uh, you may give the rogue powers that she can only use once per dungeon level, such as the rest mechanic in Forays into Norindrin. You may present the player with opportunities to trade between different numeric values in your games. So such as trading strength for armor class, trading hit points for staff, staff charges, or lowering faith to lower wandering monster chance. You may give the player a token that can be cashed out for a better reward the longer the rogue waits, or you may give her a power that becomes more, more powerful the longer she waits. You may give her items, powers, or spells that provide a more beneficial effect the riskier the situation the rogue is in, such as a power that gets uh, buffed the more monster she's in melee with at once. You may give the player cursed items, I love cursed items, that grant abilities more powerful than what is normal, but each use is risky. Force the rogue to choose a punishment for triggering a major trap or falling victim to a legendary monster power. You could have her choose a bias to the generation algorithm for good or ill. Or finally, you could offer the player an extra life, but at some significant cost. Before I wrap up, I want to give one final note, and that is playtesting is crucial. So sometimes a choice that looks good on paper and that embodies one of the types described in this presentation, it can still end up falling flat. So it's always important to get your game in front of players and refine your choice design in response to their feedback. 
Now I ran into this myself with my own remake of Rogue. And so here in the screenshot, you'll see that the players can sometime, sometimes encounter the petrified remains of out of depth monsters. She can choose to smash the monster for an XP bonus, but at the risk of attracting an angry Medusa, the Medusa that petrified that monster. So while conceptually, this was a good risk versus reward choice, players told me in our Discord that they rarely smashed petrified monsters. And when I asked them why, they said the XP bonus was too low and rarely justified the risk of encountering one of the most dangerous monsters in the game. So this feedback helped me adjust the XP reward and the Medusa chance and to make the trade-off feel a little bit less one-sided. So choice design is a huge topic in games, and this talk really only scratched the surface. However, I hope that you found some of the concepts helpful and inspiring as you think about the design of your own roguelikes. So to very quickly summarize what I've covered today, uh, choosing is fun and dramatic because it challenges the player to weigh trade-offs, gives them a sense of agency, creates moments of uncertainty, and helps make the player feel smart. Types of engaging choices you should strive for include mutually exclusive actions, risk versus reward, now versus later, resource trade, and dilemma. Uh, I invite you to consider the kinds of choices the elements of your roguelike present the player and tune your generation algorithm to layer multiple choices in an encounter. And of course, playtesting is key. So if you'd like to learn more about my books and online courses, you can find them at tridentgamebooks.com. You can also play my remake and expansion of Rogue at victorysoftworks.com. And if you'd like a copy of the slide deck in PDF format, you could download it at bit.ly slash 3EKOTJ capital R. And so with that, I want to thank everybody again who stuck around for this final presentation. And of course, I want to thank the organizers of this conference. I've been a long time attendee and presenting here has been a goal of mine for many years. And I'm really glad that I was able to do so this year. Uh, so thank you. Hi, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I mean, that was fantastic. We thank there you. Have been people in chat saying that this is their favorite talk of the con so far. Oh, uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, which I, I appreciate. I know it can be hard bringing the con home at the end of a long day. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this was just perfect. I appreciate I think a few people were saying like you, your very leveled tone. That was a very nice pace. It was very relaxing for how oh, thank information you. dense it was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was wonderful. And there's also actually a bunch of questions, more than one oh, time to get to, which again, <laughs> yeah. impressive given it's the end of the day. Um, yeah. One of the ones that's most upvoted is uh, from Dustin, which is, what are you think some of the best ways to prevent player resource hoarding? Because that's a, a choice decision where that like, oh. do I use it now? Do I use it later? It's kind of memetically something that people get stressed out about. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one because personally as a player, like I play a lot of Dark Souls, a lot of Elden Ring, and I'm very leery about using consumables. And I always think, oh, I'll save it for the next boss. I'll save it for the next one. And then I beat the game and I have 100 like green blossoms that I've never used. I think that one is a problem that I don't know if I've really solved well. I mean, I think part of it would be to create situations where the use of consumables is, is necessary or more necessary than... Um, or a better option. So like to go back to Dark Souls, I often feel like I don't really need the consumables to beat the bosses. I can just get the timings down. But in games like roguelikes that are less about Twitch and more about tactics, there are a lot of situations where sometimes I have to teleport or I have to pray to my goddess because otherwise I'm going to lose. And because I think permadeath creates an interesting dynamic there because like, again, to go back to Dark Souls, uh, if I die to the boss, I can just try again. But in a roguelike, I can't really try again. The run is is over. So I think that creates pressure and um, entices yeah. people to use those those resources. Yeah. Um, it's actually use it or lose it. And you understand yeah. that. <laughs> oh, yeah. But I'm a very conservative player because I'm terrified all the time. So. <laughs> Isn't... Oh, that's a big mood. I think that's part of Dustin's talk tomorrow mm -hmm. is about just being terrified all the time, if I understand yeah. the topics. Yeah. Um, I'll maybe ask one more question just because it's the end of the day and we have a little bit of time here. Sure. Um, from Ecomaniac, have you found a sweet spot in terms of the amount of choices a player should have at a given time to not become totally overwhelmed? 
Yeah, there's um, a term I didn't include in this talk, um, choice density. And it is very much possible to overload the player with choices. And one of the things I wanted to touch on um, that I didn't have time for in the slide deck was with dilemma. And I think a number of people could have seen the example like, okay, prompt the player, you know, when maybe she gets hit by the Balrog or triggers a fire trap and have her pick the scroll that gets burnt up. And you really got to be careful with that because if you do that too frequently, you're constantly pulling the player out of the flow. So I think the answer to that question is just play testing. You've got to get it in front of people and feel out, you know, the vibe. And if people come back to you and saying, you know what, I feel like every 20 seconds you're asking me to, you know, pick my poison and it's taking me out of the flow, then you can dial it back a little bit. But if you don't get that feedback from players, you can kind of tune it up a little bit. And I wish I had like a, a formula or some kind of algorithm, yeah. but really it's just <laughs> as, as a lot of people who presented today can attest, it's you're just kind of feeling it out. It's more of an art than a science. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Uh, roguelikes are about vibes is mm -hmm. uh, one of the big takes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, 